Hey team, so this afternoon we're going to talk about how we start assessing the heart. We've already been through how we start to look at the heart, the images we get, the crazy promarker orientation, we look for our personal long axis, our personal short axis, our apical four, and our subcostal views. So what do we do with that information? How do we assess the heart? How do we know what's normal, what's not normal? Today we're going to talk about the five E's of focused echo. So looking for effusions, looking for the ejection, looking at equality between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, looking at the exit or the aortic outflow tract, and then the entrance, so the IVC, which we're not seeing here. The first E that we look at is the pericardial effusion, so E for effusion. The key marker here is the descending aorta. This is why we want to make sure that we have plenty of depth in order to see the descending aorta and behind the descending aorta. So we're here in our parasitical long axis, which you all now know, and we're looking, we see the bright white line of the pericardium, and we see this nice black fluid collection right there. So now we have a pericardial effusion. This is just another image of a pericardial effusion in the apical form mode. We see it wrapping all the way around the heart here. So you can see a little bit of fluid to the, uh, the right side of the heart on the screen, which is just outside the left ventricle, and on the left of the screen, just outside the right ventricle and right atrium. If you were to look closely, you would see that it actually wraps all the way around the heart coming to the left ventricle and also tapers to a point at the descending aorta. And that's really the key here, is that a pericardial effusion is going to taper to a point at the descending aorta. Whereas a pleural effusion, we're seeing right here, extends beyond and goes further back than the uh, pericardial effusion. So it goes back behind the descending aorta. We can sometimes see both a pericardial and a pleural effusion on our parasternal long axis view, and that descending aorta is the key landmark to determine what's a pleural effusion versus a pericardial effusion. So the pericardial effusion is wrapping around and tapering to a point at that descending aorta. The next one that we look at is E for ejection. So what's our overall left ventricular ejection fraction? Ejection fraction estimates are generally done by Simpson's method, which involves determining the volume of the left ventricle. It's called biplane modified Simpson's method that takes into account all of that math that you learned back in calculus. I may have been able to do this equation a little bit more quickly in my engineering days when I had one of those calculators that could probably power a spaceship. But now, I need things to be easier and fast. I need an easier method to use at the bedside. No integrals, no differentials, no calculations with n and pi. So in the emergency department, we don't use the Simpson method generally for evaluating our left ventricular ejection fraction. We use, we're going to use the eyeball method. So with the critical eye, we want to identify the left ventricle. We want to look at different aspects of how the left ventricle moves in order to determine the left ventricular ejection fraction. And we're not looking at, for an ejection fraction of exactly 65% or 18%. We are looking for hyperdynamic, normal, moderate function, or poor function. So how do we do this? We look for fractional shortening, E-point sepsal separation, endocardial movement, movement of the mitral valve annulus to give us our overall visual estimate. So right here we see a totally normal functioning heart. This is our parasternal long axis, which you now know. We are looking first at what we call the E-point sepsal separation. So if you look closely at this view, the mitral valve, so the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, the tip should be coming up and really hitting that interventricular septum right here. So you can see it nicely opening and closing, opening and closing. So that's going to be our E-point septal separation. When you start to experience less heart function or heart failure, that valve doesn't come all the way up and hit the 
interventricular septum, and we can measure that using M mode to calculate our E point septal separation. An E point septal separation of seven millimeters or greater is associated with poor function overall. Then we want to look at our mitral annulus. So we're looking at the movement of our mitral annulus, which is jumping down about a centimeter or two right here. So your mitral valve annulus should jump down or move at least 13 millimeters. And so this gives us a visual estimate of how well that's moving. If a heart is starting to fail, we're not going to see that nice jumping down of the mitral valve annulus. We want to look for fractional shortening, making sure that our interventricular septum, so our ventricular wall muscles are getting short and fat every time they squeeze. And then we're looking at our uh, overall volume and seeing if we're able to see the chamber size getting smaller and then opening again in diastole so that we know that there's a good ejection fraction from the heart. So what's the function here? Well, let's look at a couple of different things. Are we seeing all of our muscles getting short and fat? Not so much. Are we seeing our mitral valve annulus move here? Uh, not really seeing that as well. And look at our mitral valve so that very tip, the end of the leaflet of the anterior mitral valve, it should be moving up and hitting that interventricular septum. But it's not really doing that in this view, and I am also not appreciating much of a volumetric change. So putting all of that together, I know that this is a really poor functioning heart. And we can look at this view as well. So that heart function overall, not that great looking at the papillary muscles. What if we were to look here? Can you apply those same rules? We're in an apical four chamber right now, but if we were to look at the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which is heading towards the interventricular septum, if we're looking at the movement of the mitral annulus over on the right side of the screen, if each centimeter along the far right uh, side of the screen that gives you that measurement is can we tell, can we use that to determine if the mitral valve is jumping up at least 13 millimeters or one to one and a half centimeters? Are we seeing a volumetric change? Are we seeing the muscles contract? Let's say overall this is a normal functioning heart. And then compare it to this heart. What do we see the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve doing? Is it coming up and hitting the interventricular septum? Are we seeing the mitral valve annulus jump up and down? Not so much. So this is, you can appreciate the difference between that previous normal functioning heart and this heart, which isn't functioning quite as well. I'm looking at those different indicators of how we look at the overall ejection fraction of the heart. So putting all of that together, the mitral valve annular planar excursion, EPSS, fractional shortening, or endocardial excursion, we want to classify our cardiac function into hyperdynamic when the walls of the left ventricle are about coming together, normal, moderately depressed, and severely depressed. Some of the pitfalls with this are valve abnormalities, dyssynchrony, so it can be really hard to estimate an ejection fraction if the patient's in AFib. Uh, you really can't do that, or if you have left ventricular hypertrophy. The next E that we want to look at is equality, and this is going to be making sure that all your chambers are the correct size. So we talked in the last lecture about how the right ventricle at the very top, the aortic outflow tract, and the left atrium should all be one to one to one. And that's important, but what we really want to highlight when we're looking at the E for equality is the size, relative size of the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So we talked in the last series that the right ventricle is about two thirds the size of the left ventricle. So we can see that here. The right ventricle is a nice uh, horn shape and the left ventricle should be a little bit more of a bullet shape.
We become worried when we start to see the right ventricle ballooning out and increasing in size to become one-to-one -one with the left ventricle or sometimes even larger than the left ventricle. There's a whole differential diagnosis regarding what can cause that right ventricular enlargement and right ventricular hypertrophy and whether it's an acute or chronic finding, but that is something we want to make sure that we are assessing for. Is the right ventricle about two-thirds the size of the left ventricle as it should be, or is there something going wrong with the chambers? So if we look closely at this, we ask what chamber is the wrong size here? If you look closely, you can see that the aortic outflow tract is larger than the right ventricle and the left atrium. If we look at this view and ask what chamber is the wrong size, we'll see that our right ventricle looks huge compared to the left ventricle. The left ventricle actually looks extremely small in this view. And what about right here? Same thing. That right ventricle is huge. I would say it's even larger than a one-to-one -one ratio compared to the left ventricle, which is on the right of the screen. And our final image in a peristernal short axis. I think you can all appreciate now that you're seeing a really large right ventricle and a much smaller left ventricle. And also look at the interventricular septum. It should be a nice O and that left ventricle should actually be able to keep a nice round shape uh, throughout the cardiac cycle. But right now we're seeing this paradoxical wall movement abnormality of the interventricular septum and it's flattening out and almost looks like the capital letter D. This is something that we see with acute increases in your right-sided pressures, which is concerning. I will say that these images came from a patient with a pulmonary embolism. Our next E is going to be exit. So this one we're looking at the aortic root and the proximal aorta. So a normal aortic root just above the sinuses of Valsalva is less than four centimeters. If you have an aortic root over four and a half centimeters, this is what's considered aneurysmal. So why is this important? Enlarged aortic roots have a higher incidence of aortic dissection and can lead to different cardiac problems down the road. So if you see this, this is definitely something you want to note and address. And our final E is the entrance or the IVC. So we're going to look for the confluence of the IVC as it enters the right atrium. And we wanna make sure that we also identify the confluence of the hepatic veins as they enter the IVC. We look distal to the confluence of the hepatic veins in the IVC and look for a normal pattern of a collapse with respiration. In a spontaneously normally breathing patient, the IVC should collapse with normal inspiration. There have been attempts to correlate the IVC size to the central venous pressure and looking at the percentage of total collapse. This is something that works usually better at extremes, a plethoric large IVC versus a completely collapsible small IVC. So now we reviewed how to do a focused assessment of the heart. This does not represent everything involved in a comprehensive echo, but always looking at these five things will give you a good global assessment of the heart. It's something that we can do in a matter of minutes in the emergency department when you have a super sick patient that's coming in. So always look for an effusion using the descending aorta as your marker for a pericardial effusion versus a pleural effusion. Look at the left ventricular ejection fraction. Look for the relative size of the left ventricle and right ventricle. Look at the exit or the aortic root and the entrance or the IVC. Please feel free to email me with any questions.